Welcome, everybody. Hey, hey. <laughs> Good boy, Tucker. Work smarter where you want. This is learning at its most fun. We're, we're starting the day, and I think this is... Austin, you're hanging out with me, right? Like, yes. We're going to say, we're gonna say bye to Catherine. All right. So uh, we're going to be starting the day with talking about essentially cleanup, you know, getting your database ready. Um, a lot of the times you might even been saying, hey, I've been using my database for years. I have everything organized. We're really going to be talking a lot of a few foundations themselves and just how to do continuous cleanup as you go through. Um, because sometimes like as you're working and you forget, like things might pile up and all of a sudden you didn't realize how dirty the data might have actually gotten. Uh, so with that itself, what we're going to be covering is dirty data. One of those, we're going to explain dirty data itself. What is that? What does it mean? We're going to talk about some expectations with your database, like I mentioned, also some foundations. Austin and I are also going to give you some best practices and just a few ideas on just some cleanup methods itself. So really, like it's, it's not going to, we're not going to be diving in a whole lot into the CRM with this. We're going to be showing you, just, uh, showing you some tips uh, to keep the cleanup going well. Um, and again, like there's, there's a lot of different ways you can uh, actually dive into clean up the data and we're going to show you what's best. So what is dirty data? Where does it come from? Personally, uh, dirty data can come from, you know, like where you don't complete an activity. I mean, Catherine already mentioned that you don't, you're not staying on top of everything. Think of data itself, like on a spreadsheet. You know, so that's what a database is. It's all these different layers of different spreadsheets. And sometimes there's missing information. Sometimes there's too much information, information that's not being used. Um, so there's a lot of different ways where it can actually be created. Uh, so Austin, like what's, what's one of the common ways like that you can, you've seen dirty data be created? Well, it could come from a couple different sources, Curtis. Uh, but the biggest I usually will see is, is when we transfer from one database to another. So whether we're opening up a second red tail subscription or maybe we're moving from maybe a legacy CRM and transferring the data over into red tail CRM. Sometimes, you know, we didn't do the best job of maintaining it in that older CRM. And so we're bringing things over um, and complete. The other option is we have um, sometimes where we have multiple people entering data and we have different expectations of where data might should go. And so... Curtis, I might put a certain data point in one field and you might feel that it goes into a different spot. And so it's really important for us to get on the same page of where certain data points should go in the CRM. Absolutely. So that that is a big common thing we see is you have, you know, let's say you have four or five different people in your CRM or even like upwards of like 80 people. We have some pretty large databases, but even if you're, you're in a smaller database, you know, there's two of you, three of you, four of you, and you're not doing things consistently, that can actually create dirty data like and again um one example is uh hey austin like if i were to label all of my clients um a b and c and you label all of your clients a double a triple a you know like hey we, we have yeah. different ways of naming our clients but we're using the same database that can create some dirty data because we're choosing to label in different ways um, or even with Oh, go ahead. Even if we use the same categories, maybe we both use A, B, and C, but I have a different expectation of what constitutes for an A client versus what constitutes for a B client. Making sure that we have concrete definitions about how each one should be labeled is a super important thing for preventing dirty data. Absolutely. Like that's, that's actually, that's a big one is you need to make sure you know exactly what all of your different terms mean, because even though that red tail is an out of the box solution, like we have a lot of things that are pre-built out for you to organize you actually can still customize it in a way to where you can be very specific or more general. But if you're being specific in one way, like if Austin, if you're saying, hey, all of my A clients is anyone who, you know, makes uh, $500,000 or, you know, or has a portfolio of $500,000 or more, they're my A clients. But if I'm looking at A clients and I'm saying, well, to get be an A client, they have to send me referrals you know, two different, you know, di different ways of, of thinking for method, but like we need to get on the same page. So that's a big thing is making sure that everyone in your database is on the same page with all the terminology you're using. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about what are the expectations is that your CRM is for clients. Okay. So I, uh, we have, we're adding in all of our clients. Is that true, Austin? What does no. CRM actually stand for? No, no, no. Of course it's, it's contact relationship management. So it's, it's, it extends beyond just your clients. We have things like 
prospects and leads and maybe spouses of our clients and children of our clients? How about other businesses that we might come in contact with? All the different relationships that your business comes in contact belongs in Redtail CRM. And it's okay to be a data hoarder. We don't have to, I, I know this is some, a trap that a lot of people will fall into is, well, in order to maintain my database and make it clean, I'm just going to limit the data that I could put in there. No, no, no. We want to be we want to be plentiful in the data that we're providing because we're going to get more usage out of our CRM system with the more data that's in there. We just got to make sure that it's going in there in an organized fashion. Absolutely. So keep in mind, again, everybody that goes, everything in your CRM is for your contacts. And again, that's more than just your clients. It's people who are attached to your clients. So, so Austin said, and you can even see on the slide here, everything in the middle is our clients, but then their spouse, there's businesses, there's employers, there's dependents, all these different places uh, that you can add other contacts and still organize them. And so far, all we've done, Austin, is we're using the two fields of status and category. Is that correct? Just by labeling these. So when you look yeah. at the slide, the over the, on top of the line is client, below it is their category level. And we're gonna dive in to talk a little bit more about how to customize those itself. But keep in mind, we're using just two fields to organize all of these different people and know exactly why they're in our database. Yeah, I want to just call out a couple of those because just commonly questions I get is what category should you put in for perhaps a spouse or a child or client? I like to actually set the category to match the category of the client. So of course, if I have one head of household labeled in there and I have their spouse that I also want to include, I want to put the category that matches that because I want to be able to make sure that I treat them like a triple A spouse rather than a single A spouse. Or the same thing with that child, right? When they grow up and they might inherit that money, they're probably going to be put into that triple A category because that's where their parents were. Now, the other common thing you get is, well, what if both of them are clients, right? We don't pick favorites here in our office. Both are clients. Well, we're just going to label them as such, right? It's perfectly acceptable to have a status of client for both spouses and just have them merge together in the same family, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Absolutely. So let, let's, let's dive into that a little more. So when you actually define what all of those fields mean, the best, the best thing we can actually say is create a style guide. And so a style guide is really just that you've laid, you've written out all of your different statuses, your categories, all the different fields that you've customized for the database and define what they mean. So anybody who comes in and uses your database can look at this, this style guide, this sheet of paper and know exactly what they mean. So right away, we know that if they have the status of lead, it means that all we have is their contact information and no interactions with the contact. That, that's what it means. Now, again, that might be something different for you, but for our database, that's what we've decided. If they're a prospect, it means they're, they have contact inf inf information and interaction has been made with the contact. So again, then moving down, then all, as soon as they're an active client, we have accounts are held for the contact. All of these are really just defining what it means to be a status. And in Redtail, each contact can only have one status. Again, one status per contact record. So that's why it's really important to define. If you ever have yourself saying, well, this contact record can be either status one or status two, it means that you're, you're not being specific, or sorry, you're being too specific with your actual statuses. So in that case, if I were to say, I have lead and I have prospect, but I really, I, I actually know databases who don't use lead versus prospect. They just use prospect or they just use lead. If those are really the same thing to you, combine them into one. If you can say this person can fall under either category, maybe it's, it's too specific. It needs to be a little more general. So again, that's just for tips and how to clean this up. And again, you're going to further get, get into it with those categories of using like A, AA, AAA, A, B, C, D, gold, silver, platinum. Um, so let's actually is, jump in. What oh, you're okay. saying is it's going to get us on the same page, all pun intended, right? <laughs> all pun intended. Yeah, same page. So let's actually look at where that is in the CRM itself. So where is status? Let's actually, I'm going to use uh, our contact record, Kevin Arnold. So in the CRM, when you're looking at the main contact record, what we're talking about right now is down here where it says contact details. And we can see that he's an active client and he has the category of AAA. Those are those two fields. If I were to change, if I need to change the values for the specific contact, I can hit edit up here. And then I have my drop down menu. 
this is the list that you can actually customize. You can change what's in these drop down lists. And then again, you can define what they are. So again, if I have active client, I, we level them with A, AA, AAA. But if you prefer something like gold, silver, platinum, A, B, C, D, you can actually go in and change those. It's completely up to you. Curtis, where can I go to change those? So if you, if you want to actually change those lists, you're going to go to your name in the top right hand corner. And then from there, you're going to choose manage your account. Once you're on the manage your account page, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom. And there's this section called admins only. Now, if you don't see the section that says admins only, all it means is your username does not have access. Um, the database owner or another admin can go in or even give you admin rights. But again, you need to have access to be an admins only and then go down to manage database lists. Once you click on manage database lists, I will point out the first list you're gonna see is gonna be account types. But we're actually gonna direct our attention over to the right hand side and you can see where it says manage lists. And this is, I always kind of joke about this. This is a list of lists. It's like inception. There's lists inside of lists inside of lists, just keeps going on. But in the manager account, manage database list section, on the right hand side, I can see I have customizable lists under accounts, a lot of them under contact. So if I actually click on the word statuses here, it's going to load my list on the left hand side. Easy enough. If I want to add to this list, I can hit add and I can type in, I wanna add the word client easy enough and I can add that to that list and now it's available to add to a contact record. Now here's a case where it's, it's bad data, it's dirty data in a sense. I have active client and I have client as a status. Austin, is it, how, how can I just delete them? Is that, how can I clean this up? Well, actually Red Cell has a really cool feature where we can kind of merge them together. So. We can make a determination on here whether we want to use active client or client. And then when we choose the delete option by going over to the actions arrow on the right hand side and choosing delete, Redtail is going to ask us, do we want to apply a new value to the existing records? What this means is deleting client, any, anybody that might have been labeled as client, the status of client, is now going to be updated to active client. So instead of it going back to a not specified status, we're going to automatically change all of those that were previously labeled clients into active clients when we remove client from the database list. And this is, this is a really important step into making sure that you don't have dirty data created. Because we, even, we do give the option of saying, if I'm deleting client, I can actually uncheck this and it just means I'm gonna delete client from the database. I'm not going to apply a new value to the contact records who happen to have that status. If you do that, it means that you can no longer search by that status, even though the contact is not gonna have a status, it's not gonna be searchable. So in this case, make sure that you decide what do I want to change the status to first before it actually gets deleted. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, so back over here again, when you create those statuses, we really suggest define them in some way, even if it's, even if it's real short, like, hey, like lead means brand new contact record, you know, it'd be very simple, but any little bit of writing in a style guide is going to help get everybody on the same page. Hey, Curtis, is there any like examples of style guides that I can maybe use as a template to build mine? Actually, Austin, great idea. So if you actually want to say, hey, we want a style guide, we want examples, we want to see what's available. What I'm going to suggest is if you come up to the question mark in the top right hand corner and then click right here where it says Redtail Help Desk, it'll take everybody to the Redtail Help Desk. And all you have to do is up here in the search, you can just put style guide, just type in the word style guide and hit enter. It's going to search our help desk. And you'll see right here, the first one that says style guide this actually walks you through what a style guide is, very similar to actually the exact same you know, image that we have on our slideshow today. It even gets a little more detailed with the categories and shows a lot of different examples, but you can actually scroll down to the bottom and we have where you can download a sample, uh, you know, a download a completed style guide in Word or a PDF or one that's blank. So the first two are blank, the second two are completely filled out with examples. It's up to you. That's just a way to give you an idea of where to start with organizing this. Yeah, no, no reason to reinvent the wheel. You can have a good starting point with Redtail. We'll provide you with some examples on how you should set up your style guide and then you can kind of tweak it and make it your own. Before I move on from status and category, I just want to address, you know, maybe the skeptic on the call that says, you know, it's not really worth the time. It's not really worth, you know, going through and cleaning that all up do a favor for your future self, okay? 
This happens to me every November, never fails. We have a person that sets up a training call and they say, hey, Austin, I really want to send out a Thanksgiving card to my top clients. So this is great. We'll use the mail merge feature in Redtail. We'll make you a nice little card and we'll be able to send that out. Well, we get going with making that Thanksgiving card and we're ready to get it sent it out. But we go to the advanced search tool in Redtail and all of a sudden we can't find that list, right? There's no way of distinguishing who is a client and who is a prospect and who is a spouse and et cetera. And then we don't know, who, even if we know who the client is, we might not know who's in that top tier, right? If we don't have the category in place. So again, you might not think that this is something that's super important for you to clean up now or a style guide sounds like a lot of work, but I'm telling you, your future self will appreciate it. Absolutely, Austin. I love that you point that out because again, it's if you want to do anything with these groups and most people do, I need to know who my top clients are versus my lower clients. How do I separate them? Status and category is the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. And even, and we're going to later on, we're going to show you how to do some bulk changes. So you can actually really dive in and see how to make these changes easier if you don't have it set up quite yet this way. Yes. Now, the other uh, one of the other data foundations is the contact itself where we want to talk a little bit about the contact card. Now, this is probably like the most basic part of a CRM is where it's just a Rolodex in itself. The CRM, you know, without, without notes, without activities, without statuses, all it is is a Rolodex. And that's definitely fine. That's important information. If I go to a contact record, I need to know how I can call him, how I can email them, how I can send them a letter. And it's important to have that information. So keep in mind, you want to make sure that you have this information set up in the contact record. Now we're going to switch back over here. I'm going to use the recently viewed. We'll use that and go back to Kevin's Ar Ar Arnold's record. Once we're on, on Kevin's page, now we're going to look over here to the right hand side where we have the contact card. Now, what I love, this is actually a newer feature. I, Austin, I think this happened sometime last year where it actually yeah. has the local time for the contact. This is actually pulled directly from the zip code of the primary address of the contact record. So where it says 95610, like that is the actual zip code and that's how it's pulling this. And again, that's for the primary. How I mean that is when you actually create an act, uh, an, any type of contact information. So if we actually open up at the address, we see that the type is home. We see the address filled out here. It's this box right down here is primary is what it's pulling off of. It is very important that you have at least one primary for each type of communication for all of your contacts. And so what, I'm, what do I mean by that is where I have two email addresses, I have one for his work and one for his home. The, Kevin has two emails, one of them needs to be primary. One of his phone numbers needs to be primary. Um, Austin, what do those primary numbers also get used on? They get used for our integrations and also using our, our broadcast email tool inside Redtail CRM. So for example, if we want to send out a bulk email to a bunch of lists of our clients and, and our, Kevin is included on that list, we're going to get an error message back if we don't have a email marked as primary. Because what Redtail is going to say is there's two email addresses here. I don't know which one to send it to, so I'm going to send it to neither. And so we need to make sure that if before we go and send out that big bulk email inside Redtail CRM, we have the primary email address as otherwise we're going to get a whole slew of error messages. Also, a lot of our integration partners rely on that primary address. So if you are wanting to take this contact and send it into another platform, I'm thinking like FMG Suite, Riskalyze, there's a whole, there's a whole list of them, right? And a lot of times without a primary address, that contact can't make its way over into that platform. And so we want to make sure before we're sending contacts to our integration partners, we're marking an email address as primary. And uh, one more on top of that is the primaries are mainly used for exporting data. So if I want to export an email address or export an address, it's mainly going to look at the primary first. So keep in mind, it's going to be the most, uh, the most used one. If I reach out to the contact, how do I want to call them, email them, send them a letter? That's what you want to make sure and mark as the primary. And again, that's for each type of communication. So phone number, email address, address, I think website has a primary as well. So the different types of communication should have one primary. If I were to come over here where Kevin Arnold has, a, has his other, if I have actually come over here and choose that this one is now gonna be the primary, if I click make primary, 
it's going to change the bold from work over to home. And now this is going to be the email that we send to him. You can only have one primary type of communication uh, per email address, address, and phone number. Curtis, I also wanted to point out those types there. So we have differences like home and work and mobile. If we label an email address, a phone number, or a physical address as home, note that that is going to be shared between spouses. So for example, here we have Kevin, who is married to Winnie. And so if we label a phone number as home, that's also going to be shared information that's going to go over to the spouse's record as well. So that just saves you from some duplicate entry, right? If Kevin and his spouse live at the same address. We don't need to enter in that same address on both contact records. We just label one as home and it's gonna share it to the other. Absolutely. So the home address and home phone number from the head of household record will share over to the spouse and any dependents linked to them. And we'll actually show you how you can actually set up those linkings here in a little bit because I believe we're actually gonna talk about family next actually. So the nether next part is I have all these different contacts. I have them labeled with status. I have them labeled with category. How do I know who belongs to who? Who's tied with who? Well, we really have three different types of relationships that you can build out in the CRM. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about is family. What is the family section in Redtail? Well, I say that's the tax definition of family. Anybody who lives in the same household and is dependent on the head of household. So what that means is if, if I'm a grown child, I'm not a child, I'm an adult, but if uh, but I am a child to my parents, I do not belong in their family section. If I am put in their family section, it means that I am dependent on the head of household, but I'm not. I would be my own head of household. So again, family is very much not all family, but just very much immediate family in regards to tax definition. This also gives you the ability to link notes between family where you can actually view notes um, from any family member from the family member's record. You can view documents. There's a lot of different viewing as well as what Austin said is home address and home phone number will, will share on my record if that home and address is on the head of household record. It will share over to my record and make it uh, visible. Austin, do you wanna explain what memberships is? Yeah, memberships are for all those other relationships, right? So maybe the ones that don't exist in that immediate household or family, right? So this would be our good spot for our, our grandparents, our grandchildren, our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, whatever the relationship exists that isn't actually either spouse or dependents, those are gonna go and be labeled as memberships. And these also have the ability to customize the title. So whatever the type of relation type that you're looking to track, you can make it into a membership. And these are also going to be exportable. So I can send these into an Excel file if I need to, um, to manage my memberships and provide maybe a physical copy of them. Absolutely. And then the last one is professional. So we actually have this re uh, option where you can set up professional relationships. Um, and it's essentially who is their doctor, who is their attorney, who is their insurance. You can actually link an, another contact record to your main client and say that, you know, this person is the CPA for my client. This person is the attorney for my client. And you can actually customize those titles as well. What's great about the professional ones is unlike memberships, they are searchable. So if I needed to say, I need to find everybody in my database who has Harvey Dent as an attorney, I can use the professional section and actually run those searches and find that information. So let's actually take those three bits and let's dive into them just a little bit deeper. So starting with family, let's start and actually build out what is the family itself and we'll use Kevin Arnold as our example. So in regards to the family, you'll see in the main contact up at the top where it says Kevin Arnold, you'll see he's, uh, he works at the Wonder Years magazine, but below that he's married to Winnie Cooper and he's connected to the Arnold Cooper family. Now, when I click the Arnold Cooper family, it takes me into the actual family structure. And I can see that Kevin is established as the head of household. Winnie is set up as the spouse and they have one child who's set up. Danica Arnold is in here. Now, the family name. The family name is actually, um, it's free form text. You get to decide what it says. I always like to tell people the family name should be used at how you want to address the family as a whole. And sometimes that can be dependent on how many people are actually in this family. 
if it was a family of one, like Kevin Arnold is the only person, he is the head of household, there is no spouse, there's no dependents, I would most likely write out the family name as Mr. Kevin Arnold. I'm just going to name it by his, his name. If it was him and just a spouse, if it was him and Winnie, in that case, I would write out Mr. and Mrs. Winnie Cooper Arnold, you know, or however they want to spell it out. You can actually type that out that the family name is just addressing two people. Whereas now, since there's three people, we're actually just going to address it the Arnold Cooper family. And again, like a lot of a lot of times I see um, different uh, red tail users will put the last name family on all of the family names. And that's definitely fine. That's a great way to put it. The only reason I suggest is if it's an individual person that you don't put the Arnold family is if I were single and somebody sent me something that said the Ware family, I'd feel a little lonelier. I mean, just because I don't want to get a piece of mail that says the Ware family when I am the only family. You know, there's it's just me. So again, the family name can be used for actually mailing about how you want to address the family as a whole. If you oh. want to change that, Oh, go ahead, Austin. Well, I was going to say, Curtis, I, I don't want people to be shy about adding in family names for single individuals. It's still important that even if they're just a single individual, they still have a family name. Again, this goes back to that future self of you trying to make that holiday card and sending it out. That family name actually becomes a very valuable merge fields for using things like mail merge and broadcast email within Redtail CRM. And so we can actually take what we enter in in that family name and merge it into things like mailing labels or into a letterhead. And so- okay. Even if we have a single individual and we want to send it to them, we don't want that field to return as blank. And so it's important that, again, even single individuals have a family name. We just want to make sure that we um, edit it appropriately, which Curtis is going to show you. Absolutely. So if you do want to change what the family name says, you go to the, uh, the gear icon over to the right-hand side, and you can just hit edit. When you choose edit, it brings up the only option, which is to change the family name. So again, this is where you can type in however you want to address the family as a whole. Now, in this case, I'm just going to leave it as the Arnold Cooper family. If you need to add dependents, you can actually just click right here. And I can search for, if I know they have a child named Fred, I can search for Fred. Now, in this case, I know the last name is Arnold. And I don't see Fred Arnold in this dropdown, but I know that Fred Arnold exists as a contact record. Austin, do you possibly know why that's not why that's happening? Probably because it doesn't exist as a contact record inside Redtail CRM. However, we do have the option to be able to add it from this page here. The other option is that it is added as a contact, but it's already linked to another family. So again, if Fred already is a contact in Redtail and it's not showing up in this dropdown, we should check to see if Fred is added to his own family or another family. Exactly. So in that case, I, I searched when I, when I tried to add him as a dependent, he's not here. I searched Fred. He does not exist. Fred Arnold. That's again, because I can't add him as a dependent. Let me first check if he exists elsewhere. So if I actually just type in Fred, the first name up here in the top, right away, I have a contact record card called Fred Arnold. And actually from the search, I can see, oh, he's marked as head of household. What that means is Fred is actually part of his own family. You know, so he is the head of household of his own family. If he is set up as a household, he cannot be part of anybody else's household. So Keep in mind, you could only be one uh, part of one family at a time. So if I say, hey, he actually should not be a head of household, what I'm going to do is to dissolve his family, but not the contact. I'm dissolving the family that Fred is in. I can come over here and just delete family. So again, the action icon, delete the family, that removes his family name. What it allows me to do now is if I come back over to Kevin's record, and once I'm in Kevin's record and click back on the Arnold Cooper family and I hit add dependent, I'm now gonna search for Fred again. And now he's, he's here because he was part of a family when he shouldn't have been. I removed that family and now I can link him here and mark that he is a child of Kevin and Winnie. Easy enough. That's how you can actually make sure that your family structure is set up exactly how you need to. But the same concept for when these children grow up. As soon as Fred grows up and he is his own head of household, I can come over and I can remove him from the family and then establish him as his own head of household. So that's, that's the best advice we can give for uh, setting up families is making sure that everybody is part of at least one family. And so that way you can actually share all that information between them. Austin, why don't you go ahead and dive us into uh, to memberships a little more? 
Yeah. So here's some examples of how you can use memberships. Um, again, you got to kind of make a determination, kind of like with style guide of how, how detailed do you really want to go with memberships, right? Do I need to know everybody's in-laws or maybe I just focus on kind of their immediate family, like parents, children, grandchildren, grandparents, right? So kind of make a determination on some of the important memberships that you want to track. Hey, bro tip, maybe even include it in your style guide. Curtis, I actually want to keep going with the Arnold family and do a situation that I see kind of commonly happen with Redtail users. So let's just say, for example, here, we're going to use Fred again. And let's say that Fred is now of age. He has officially left the nest. He's no longer part of the Arnold family, but I still want to know that Fred is still a member, dare I say it, of the Arnold family. So instead, what I could do is remove him from the family, just like Curtis just did. And then what I'm going to do is navigate over to the left-hand menu, choose the more option, and that's going to allow me to add in a membership. So at this point here, I can go ahead and see that Fred has already been added as a father and son. We're going to go ahead and remove him and just re-add him again. So let's click on the add button there for memberships. We're gonna go ahead and type in the name of the contact. There's Fred. And then we're gonna go ahead and indicate the relationship. So first up is the linked contact. This is referring to Fred. So Fred is the child. So we're gonna mark him as child. And then the contact, we're on Kevin Arnold's record. So he's the contact. He is going to be, we can either label him as father or parent. And go ahead and add that membership. So again, and now I don't lose that history, right? I know that Fred is related to the Arnold family. Now he's not part of the Arnold family household anymore because again, he's of age, he's an adult child. He has a household of his own, but yet he's still connected to Kevin and Winnie as his parents. Absolutely. And again, like memberships, like Austin was saying, is just every other relationship you can possibly think of. Like even here, we have Paul Pfeiffer is linked as a friend to Kevin Arnold. Like, it's, it's nice to know, like, hey, maybe they don't do any, you know, we don't have any accounts between the two of them because they're different households, but it's nice to know that they are friends, like they are LinkedIn memberships. And again, like this can list any type of relationship you can possibly think of. And if there's not a way to describe what the relationship is, these drop down lists of these relationships are customizable. You can actually add to that list. Another one on here, Austin, is up at the top where it actually says that Kevin Arnold is the writer editor at the Wonder Years magazine. That is actually uh, one section in the field that automatically updates the memberships. So where we actually also see it right down here where it's a business, he's linked to the Wonder Years as an employee. That's because he's set up here in the employer field. Now you'll notice I can't delete this. There's no action button. I can't edit anything about this. Austin, how, how can I actually change who his employer is. We'd have to go to the icon there. It's a little icon with a pencil on his shoulder there. Go ahead and edit the basic information. And then we can go ahead and edit the employer here. So if Kevin were to change jobs, we can go ahead and update the uh, employer field to change that field. Yeah, this also brings up a really good point is that memberships can also link together individuals to either businesses or associations or even trusts. So for example, if uh, maybe you have a, a marketing source, like for example, maybe like a religious institution or a rotary club or something like that, and you want to track who, had, who belongs to that organization, memberships are also a great uh, place to do, track that information as well. Absolutely. So again, any, any way you can connect this contact of Fred Arnold to another contact record, whether that record is a business, a trust, an association, another individual person, you can use the memberships to show how they are linked. I like to describe it like this is like the spider web of relationships. There's all these different webs linking all these people together and this is how you can see what it is. Now, the last part of relationships, the third relationship that we wanna talk about is professional. Now, I love this because you can actually use professional contacts to say, who is their doctor? Who is uh, even a trusted contact? We actually have some preset professions like CPA, attorney, power of attorney that are set up in there. But if you want to add to the list, you definitely can. It's actually a customizable list, just like our status and categories. But it's a way where you can actually list who is a specific contact record that's in this profession for my client. So let's actually list that in Kevin's record to get to professional, we're actually gonna to go to the left-hand side and click on know your client. So under know your client, 
I can then click on professional, that first, that first column. And you'll see that I have this right here, the professional contacts. Right now I can see that Jake Miller is his insurance. I believe that's Jake from State Farm, pretty sure. Uh, but in this case, I also want to add in, I know that his friend, Paul Pfeiffer, it, it, it's his friend, but also Paul is his attorney. So I want to actually list that Paul Pfeiffer is the attorney for Kevin. And so to do that, I'm going to hit add on the right hand side. And I'm going to search for Paul. And from here, I can see, okay, I'm going to choose Paul Pfeiffer. And then the profession type, you'll see the system types. These are the ones that are in Redtail already but you can actually add custom types to it, just like the statuses and categories you can add to that list. But I'm gonna mark him as an attorney and then I can add easy enough. So right now in Kevin's, Arnold, Kevin's record, I can see that Jake is in his insurance and Paul is his attorney. If I actually want to find everybody who has Paul as an attorney, I can actually use the search function. So real fast, I'm gonna show that a real quick search by going to contacts on the left-hand side and then advanced search up at the top. I can actually run it by professional contacts right here. So I can say, show me a search for professional contacts where the contact is equal to, and I can actually then search, start typing in, I'm gonna put Paul Pfeiffer. And if I run that, this shows me that Paul Pfeiffer is a profession for Kevin Arnold. So I know that he is linked to Kevin Arnold in that way. So that's what we meant by professional contacts are searchable. Unfortunately, this is not something that can be done with memberships. Memberships are just a visible option. Yeah. So Curtis, if, if I need to search for it, I should put it under professional. But if I just need to reference it, I should put it under memberships. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So with that, we actually have two different cleanup methods that we want to show you in regards to changing data. So the first one is I'm going to talk about bulk changes. So we can actually run searches like advanced searches, and maybe I want to change one field for a group of contacts altogether. And so what we're going to do is the advanced search, we can then select the contacts we want to change, and then use our bulk actions to make that change. This is one of the easiest ways to go about maybe when you're first setting up and saying, hey, I didn't use category. I didn't label them A, AA, or AAA. I just labeled them as client, and now I want to start establishing their category. If you want to do something like that in bulk, you can first, again, we're going to follow these instructions is run the search. So to run a search, contacts on the left-hand side, advanced search up at the top. And let's actually, I'm going to just run all of my active clients. So I'm going to start with contact as the type. Status is going to be the field. Our operand is going to be equal to, and I'm going to say active client. So I can actually run that search. It shows here's all 272 active clients in my database. And I can go through and say, hey, I need to change these few people that are double A and this one person that's single A over to a triple A client. Okay, so I can actually select all or I can be very picky. I can select multiple, but this allows me to do some bulk changes. Once I select them, I choose contact options on the right hand side and then bulk actions. After you choose bulk actions, you're going to get this pop up and a majority of the changes you can do are right here in the middle where it says, you know, change their category, change their source, their status, their servicing or writing advisor. I can do that from this page. So in this case, if I did wanna change their category, I can select that option and say, they are all gonna be moving to AAA. Easy enough, I can make that change and it's going to update it across the board. So again, for a bulk change, you want to run a search or even maybe it's from a tag group or a quick list or any kind of like any kind of list that you have that combines contacts together, you can bring them up on the search page to make those bulk changes. All right, Austin, why don't you uh, show us the second way, which is very similar, but it mm -hmm. has a, a, a little more uniqueness to it, I believe. Yeah, for this method, I recommend headphones and snacks. This is for making those individual type changes. So for example, when we have to update contacts tax ID number, right? By definition, every single person in that list is going to have a different tax ID number. So we can't really use a bulk action to update all of those. Instead, we're gonna need, need to navigate record to record to find the missing tax ID numbers and fill them in. So I'm gonna teach you the most efficient way to do this. Let's head back to the CRM system here. Now, I'm just gonna focus on just my clients right now. I don't wanna make too big of a list for myself. So let's start off, we're gonna do type is contact, the field is status, 
Let's go ahead and op rent equal to and choose active client. Then I'm going to navigate over to the right and hit the and button, and that's going to enter in a second criteria. So in this case, I'm going to choose contact. Let's find the field of tax ID number. And I'm going to choose the operand for is empty. Is empty. This is going to return back any contacts in my database that might have a missing tax ID number. So in this case, I came back with two. What I can do is just go ahead and click into the first one here. I'm going to come on down to the contact details tab. I can go ahead and enter in that tax ID number, update the contact details. And then rather than going back and running that search again, I could just navigate up to the top here and click the next button. And that's going to take me to the next record. So now we're on Hannah's record. We'll go ahead and enter in her tax ID number, and then we'll be finished with our list. So we're just going to repeat this, so on and so forth. And at any time we need to go back to that main page, we can click that blue return to search button to take us back. So again, a little bit more of a tedious process, but using those navigation icons, we can go ahead and move from record to record nice and quickly to fill in pieces of missing information. Now, Austin, why is it um, whenever I go to like contacts and I click on, if I click on a contact from here that I don't get that, I can't click to the next contact. Why can't I do that? What, where did that come from? It came from running a search. So we're going to need to either use the advanced search tool or a saved quick list in order to have that navigation icon appear. So again, advanced search like Curtis is showing here will allow for those navigations icon. We can't do that from the contacts A to Z. We can only do that when we're running searches. Absolutely. So once you run a search and then you click on like any of those contacts, you then get this blue section where you can go to the previous return to search or next. And like Austin said, it has to be from an actual search first. All right, perfect. So I love those two methods of cleanup because again, sometimes, hey, everybody's gonna have the same value. Other times everyone's gonna have a different value because it's a unique number like tax ID. And so there's different ways to go about that. All right, so uh, last thing that we really sort of wanna put here as we're wrapping up this section before we're going into our first 10 minute break here is what's next? How do I keep this up? Uh, we, we always like to say, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Like that's a really common saying because there's a lot to it. You can't expect that a CRM is gonna be, is gonna be perfectly you know, clean by just going one day of actually doing the cleanup itself. Cleanup is a continuous thing. You have to say, okay, where, where, did, I, uh, where did I miss information? Actually, let's, let's stick with that missing tax ID search, Austin. Like how often is like, hey, I, I went through, I know last year at the beginning of the year, I went through and made sure every single active client had a tax ID in it. Why a year later, then all of a sudden are there contacts without tax ID missing? How did that happen? Well, I mean, I could have just added a contact. Things get missed sometimes. So in that case, I want to do maybe like a repeating activity, a workflow, something that's gonna tell me, hey, you need to do the cleanup process. Hey, run this search to look for anybody who's missing a tax ID. Create a structure of how often you're gonna be reaching or how often you're going to be examining or auditing your database to see what needs to be cleaned up. Yeah, another pro tip we have here as far as what's next is I like to say, determine if the juice is worth the squeeze. So identify those essential data points, the things that must be in red tail. If you ask me, it's gotta be status and category. That's our first part. I also really use keywords heavily. And so keywords are another great spot to put in there. And then that essential contact information that Chris and I talked about, that Rolodex data, phone numbers, email addresses, physical addresses. For me, that's essential. I need that information. Now, do I need to link all of their in-laws as memberships? Well, you know, that's probably going to depend client to client, or, you know, maybe that's not something that I'm ever really going to use. So I probably shouldn't invest too many time and resources in making that happen. So again, Determine what are the essentials? What are most important for your contact? And that's going to depend on what the relationship with the contact is. I'm probably going to have more information for my AAA clients than I am for just my single A clients. Absolutely. And, and again, with that information, because you've determined what a single A means over AAA, that's going to help you narrow down who do I need to focus on? I'm going to find the missing gaps for my AAA, but I don't need to worry about that information for, for our single A's. If you don't have that decided, or, you know, like saying, this is what it is. It's going to be harder to understand what you need to clean up. Thanks so much for joining us today for this particular session. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call at 800 
206-5030, option three for support, or just shoot us an email over to support at redtailtechnology.com. Thanks a lot and have a great day.